So let me tell you where we've been in the public health. This model is borrowed from camera Phyllis Jones. This is a cliff. This is a child walking towards the edge of the cliff. The child falls off and hits the bottom. That child is broken. And when that child is broken, what we hope is that there are ambulances ready to pick him up and that there's air in the tires and that they can then go to a hospital filled with decent doctors and decent nurses. That's what we're hoping for. This is called tertiary care. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is the tertiary care hospital probably in the world. Certainly one of the very few. We are magnificent at picking up broken children. But then some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let people hit the bottom? So what they did is they built trampolines halfway down under the hope that the kids would bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. But what happens is some kids bounce off and in times of social stresses or economic um, stress, then that trampoline gets holes in it and kids fall through. That is called secondary prevention. This is what drug treatment is. This is what um, uh, Covenant House is, what I do there. Kids who have fallen off the cliff and we're trying to prevent them from hitting the bottom. And then some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let kids fall off the cliff in the first place? So what they did is they built a fence. They filled, built a fence at the edge of the cliff so that kids wouldn't fall off. The problem is that the kids keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming, and in time, some kids fall off. And in times of economic stresses or social duress, then that fence gets holes in it and kids fall through. That is called primary prevention. Primary prevention is when you build a fence at the edge of the cliff to prevent people from falling through. But where do you build the fence? And whom do you keep in? So now you do large epidemiologic studies to figure out who's likely to fall off. And we have the answer. It's black people. It's brown people. It's indigenous nations. It's gay people. It's poor people. And we understand that that is the population that falls off the cliff. And now you have racism and classism in social policy. And more important, you have unconscious biases that we all bring to the table about individuals from a group known to have bigger problems. Then what happened is some people said, that's crazy. Why would you let people fall to the edge of the cliff in the first place or get to the edge of the cliff? And then they said, let's look at the social determinants that make it more likely for you to hit the edge of the cliff. And this was about 15, 17 years ago. And this was great because this is undoubtedly about race because of racism. This is undoubtedly about being gay because of homophobia. This is undoubtedly about being poor because of unequal distribution of resources. And it changes everything. And where we are now, like we have never been in the history of humanity, is we understand that the social determinant that ties all of this stuff together more than anything is childhood trauma. How did we begin learning this? This is the first study sponsored by the CDC, published in 1988, and 98, excuse me, and um, by Felidi and Anda. And um, it worked with 18,000 people in San Diego County at one big um, health uh, center, um, uh, uh, insurance group. And it asked those people, um, their 50s to 80s, they are middle class primarily. And it asked these people, um, Tell me about your health status. So it asked all the normal questions. Are you obese? Have you had heart disease? Have you had strokes? Um, have you um, had cancers, autoimmune diseases? It asked all those questions that people have always asked. But then it went a step further. And it said, tell me um, uh, about your social conditions. Tell me if you've been divorced or abandoned your family. Tell me if you've been to jail, tried to commit suicide, used drugs, or engaged in domestic violence. And then it went further than any study had ever done, which it said, tell me what happened to you in childhood. And it asked these questions that we now call the ACEs or the Adverse Childhood Experiences. Who has been trained up on these? 
Awesome. So now you're all going to get trained up. These are the um, 10 ACEs. Have you been emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, neglected? Have you been exposed to substance abuse in your household, mental illness in your household, domestic violence in your household? Were one or both of your parents sent to prison? And were your parents divorced or did you experience parental abandonment? That gave people an ACE score. For every one of these things, you got a score of one. I do want you to know that the literature is expanding now, and we understand that this doesn't begin to describe ACEs. So for example, the new literature is looking at things like guns on the street, racism, poverty, things like that, okay? Here's what we found. Um, in, a, in a graded fashion, meaning the more bad things happen to you, the worse your outcome. That if you had just, and then the highest that these kids got rated was up to four. So that if you had four or more of these things, you were in the highest category for the study. So then it was one to four. And in a graded fashion, meaning two was worse than one, three was worse than two, four was worse than three, we discovered the outcomes. Let me stop here for a minute. And let me tell you that for my kids at Covenant House, their ACE scores are nine or 10. All right? Um, for your kids who are suffering from poverty, you need to know you have a lot of kids with A scores much higher than four. But even for four, here's what we know. We know that if you were abused as a child, even one, that you were more likely to um, uh, do drugs when you grow up, to abandon your family when you grow up, to be in jail. Does that surprise you? No you were up to 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide. Remember that the completers are not in the study, so that actually dials down how, um, what the problem really is. Um, we know that you were more likely to get viral hepatitis, which is liver disease. Not surprising if you know that that's about sex and drugs. We know that you were more likely to be obese. You were more likely to have had a heart attack, to have had strokes. You're more likely to have had cancers. You're more likely to have autoimmune diseases like lupus. You're more likely to have the common cold. In fact, if you were abused as a child, you were more likely to have osteoporosis or brittle bones as a 70 or 80 year old woman. This changes everything. It means that if we could ever think beyond one congressional cycle, we know what to do to really affect the health, well being, and even economy of the nation. We also know something else. There is a parallel body of research that says these bad things, though, they don't happen to you if you have had an adult alongside you who stood beside you. And if you had someone who had your back, even during the worst of times, you ended up looking very much like everybody else. Are you curious scientifically what's going on? Someone say yes. yes. All right. Here's what's going on. I am in my jungle chair, all right? And something bad happens to me, um, like um, a, a tiger comes and attacks. Then I jump up and I run. But when, my, when what's happening that's bad to me is not a, uh, a tiger, but it is my father in my bedroom, poverty on the streets, bullets flying, abuse when I never know when it's going to happen, then I do not have adrenaline telling me to jump and run. Instead, I need to be able to run and jump in any direction. I need to be hyper vigilant, always waiting for something bad to happen. I always have to be nervous, wondering what direction it's going to come from. If I have to be nervous at all times and have to be ready to run and jump at all times, what do you think my blood pressure needs to be, high or low? Hi. Does anyone know the hormone of, if the hormone of acute stress is adrenaline, does anyone know the hormone of chronic stress? It's cortisol, all right? It is cortisol. Cortisol keeps me nervous and keeps my blood pressure high. To keep my blood pressure high chronically, cortisol will set, if, you, if I'm exposed to it chronically in childhood, it will reset my endocrine system, meaning my hormone system, so that I'm always having cortisol, cortisol so I'm holding on to salts, so I'm drinking more water, it, so I'm eating more food. It will do it for me. 
What else does cortisol do? If you had a rash on your skin and you went to the CVS to pick something up, you just go to the pharmacy and say, what do you think I should use? What are they going to put on it? Hydrocortisone. Why? Because it's an anti-inflammatory. It shuts down your body's immune response so that that, um, uh, will, so that will go away. If you are bathed in an anti-inflammatory, in something that shuts down your immune response early on, your immune system changes for life, and that explains why it is that you are more likely to get um, autoimmune diseases and cancers. Because what are cancers? They're cells that go out of control in your body that we all have all the time, but it doesn't matter because our immune system eats them. But if your immune system is shut down, more of them will escape. Um, the obesity that comes from the uh, hormone system changing is what's going to lead to so many of the other problems. We get this. So scientifically, and it's going to change your brain, which we're going to talk about in 30 seconds. So scientifically, we understand exactly what's going on. Now we're moving into what I call Ginsburg theory. A Ginsburg theory is, well, gosh, it makes sense to me, but I can't prove it. All right? What is the, why is it that I am protected by the loving presence of my grandmother? I believe it's because when, my, when I am sitting in my jungle chair, never knowing what my daddy's going to do to me, but my grandma says to me, can I have your back? When that happens, then I borrow her cortisol. I borrow her cortisol, her hypervigilance. When I can borrow her hypervigilance, then I do not need to mount my own. That is the power of love. And let me be extraordinarily, explicitly clear here. When there is a grandmother at home protecting a child, that will transform their entire life. When there's a grandmother at home protecting a child or a mother protecting a child, you are additive. When there is not a grandmother at home protecting that child, then the only place where that child might be safe is school, and you are the most critical forces in these kids' lives. Period. Hands down. All right? That is the power of love. And then the next question is, unless, until when? We know that your immune system and your endocrine system and the changes of your brain um, are done by the time you're five. The question is, can we still transform it during adolescence? And this is a question for research. But I already told you how I feel about it. Now let's talk about what ACEs do to your brain. So there are three main elements of your brain that are going to change. The red part of your brain um, is your cerebral cortex. Um, your cerebral cortex is the thinking part of your brain. That, it is also your executive function, how you organize. It is also the brakes on your emotions. Your emotions start somewhere else, and this is the part of your brain that stops your emotions or modulates your emotions. Your cerebral cortex is thinner and less organized when you've been bathed in cortisol during childhood. Increased rates of ADD, increased impulsivity, explained here. The next part of your brain is the semicircular part of your brain called your hippocampus. Your hippocampus is what integrates information, thoughts, feelings, and sensations into memory. Therefore, we should not be surprised that people, uh, and this is also less organized, that people who have been traumatized are less likely to be able to integrate information. Um, so they're gonna have learning disabilities. The next thing is your amygdala, the green part of your brain. This is the same part of your brain that a lizard has, that a frog has. It says run, jump, danger. And this part of your brain is on fire for your entire life when you have been traumatized because you needed to learn to jump at any moment and to be hypervigilant and it never turns off. So what does it do to your behavior? The first thing that it does is it makes kids not trust us. Um, and by the way, when I say kids, I don't mean all kids, I mean more likely to. And when I say kids, it probably also includes their parents who have been traumatized. Okay? It makes kids less likely to trust us, which I have to tell you is really hard for me. Remember I told you a little bit about my study? My, you know, I, my, I did 12 years of research on how to engage kids and how to have them trust you. So when a kid doesn't trust me, it's really, really hard for me, I have to tell you. And another thing about these kids is that they're more likely to be reactive, to be really kind of explosive. And, you know, I'm obviously a very hyperkinetic, hyperactive guy, but um, 
I also am the calmest guy you're ever going to meet. So when someone's reactive, it, it freaks me out. What, what is reactive? It's like if this was a movie theater, right, and there's 500 people in the movie theater, and then one guy comes in, and then he trips on the side, and he spills his uh, popcorn, and um, like, you know, almost everyone looks and goes, oh, he's okay, and watches the movie. But you know there's that one person who just can't stop. I paid $14 for this movie, now you're ruining it, and you think, you, you know, you owe me and my girls, right? You see someone who's just reactive, they make you crazy, right? That's what reactive is. And another thing about these kids is they're more likely to lie to you. Right? Why is it? It's because, you know, if you grew up in a house where your daddy opens up the refrigerator and he says, hey, who took the last hot dog? And you say, I did, daddy. And then he throws you against the wall. You very quickly learn to stop seeing hot dogs, right? You lie. But for me, it's so hard because I'm a doctor. And unlike you who are blessed to have long experiences with kids, I have intense short bursts of experiences, which means I need to know what's going on in their life quickly, and I need to ask them questions. And when they lie to me, it's so hurtful. And another thing about these kids is that they're more likely to confabulate, right? They're more likely to just make up stories that really make no sense at all. Um, and uh, that's really, really, and why does that happen? It's because when you're abused as a kid, you remember like the Super Bowl stain on the wall and the water stain on the ceiling, but you don't remember what happened to you at all. And you have to fill in your life with an alternative reality. But for me, who's trying to get a history and trying to connect with kids when they're just confabulating and making up stories, and especially when you get close to the kids' truths, have you ever noticed that the kids who are, have had the toughest lives, you get close to them and all of a sudden they begin talking about things that make no sense at all? It's like really, really hard. And another thing about these kids is they're more likely to zone out. You know why? Because when bad things were happening to them, being in another planet was a really smart thing to do. But for me, I'm all about human connection. You know, human connection is what it is that, that gives me energy. Like, I completely draw your energy. It's why I have to walk, because I have to see all of you, right? And, and so when a kid is, you know, when I'm getting close to them and then they just zone out, it's so hard for me. Like, do you see how hard this work is? The kids aren't necessarily trusting me. They're more likely to lie to me, more likely to confabulate, more likely to be reactive, more likely to zone out, especially when I'm getting close. It's really, really hard for me if I thought it was about me. Trauma-informed care begins by understanding how people behave and understanding that it has nothing to do with you. The only thing that is healing is love and empathy. And you will not allow yourself to love or be empathetic with the kids who are hardest to manage if you think it's about you. If you think the behavior problem in the classroom is a reflection of you and disrespect towards you, then you will try to take control. And you're going to try to take control away from a kid who's always had control taken away from them to begin with, and you're going to re-traumatize them. It begins by understanding what is about you and what is not about you. And that is why being um, uh, um, schooled in this subject matter is so incredibly important, so that you can remove yourself from the equation and turn your empathy on. And the other thing is, the other main part of trauma-informed care is to understand, um, to change your lens from what's wrong with you, Curtis, to what happened to you. You don't say that. You don't say that, because if you say that, that can trigger the kid. It's about your mindset. It's about the breathing that you have to do to remind you that, um, uh, that something happened to this kid. See, being trauma-informed is healing for us and for youth, because when you remove yourself from the equation, your potential for burning out gets down. When you allow yourself to love kids who are not outwardly lovable, you're going to remind yourself why you became a teacher in the first place. But I also want to say that focusing on trauma or risk can re-traumatize as well. I don't want to give kids free passes because something happened to them. That's oppressive. You still have to hold kids accountable, all right? So this is the Boys and Girls Club mission statement to enable all young people, especially those who need us the most, to reach their full potential as productive, caring, responsible citizens. Here's what you have to remember. You know, my daughter is a, um, um, both of them are actually studying to become teachers now, which I'm incredibly happy about. And um, they, one of them came home from her first, like, it was a pre-K experience, and she came home and she said, Abby, you know, it's so much easier to work with the cute kids. They just come right up to you. And I was like, yes, but remember this. 
It's the kid in the corner whose nose is running and who doesn't even know someone can help. It's the kid with the dirty t-shirt who doesn't know it's dirty. It's the kid who pushes you away who needs you the most. The kids who need you the most are the ones who push us away. The youth who need us the most are those who push our buttons. It's why you've got to know your buttons. You can't be trauma-informed if you don't know what it is that pushes you. And the youth who need us the most raise uncomfortable feelings in us. I don't know you, but there's a lot of trauma in this room, I guarantee it, because we're all human beings. And trauma knows no demographic, okay? So when you've been through things, these kids are gonna push your buttons in a big, big way and raise uncomfortable feelings. The bottom line of trauma-informed care is be kind. Um, everyone's fighting a battle.